what I thought I would do this morning to kind of set the stage for some of our other panel discussions is um, we have two different research projects that we've just completed uh, at ACG Research, and um, one of those is in the area of automation and um, uh, adaptive network automation, and the other is in the area of open source and open source utilization. And so my intention here in the next 10 or 15 minutes is to share some of those findings with you and um, try to set the stage for what is our subsequent panels here. So but before diving in too much, it's important to have kind of a frame of reference. And uh, at ACG Research, at least, um, you know, part of what we've thought about is um, certainly you have um, the ideas of SDN and, and separate control from data plane. You also have the ideas of virtualization, whether that's containers or, or VMs, um, um, but you have the idea of virtualization. On top of that is some level of orchestration, whether it's uh, network orchestration or service orchestration. And then generally speaking, we're building a, a, a catalog of services and templates and those types of things. But the piece on the right that's kind of now being injected and that is the topic of, of this uh, activity and the ZSM is how can we add a level of intelligence and a level of automation um, that maybe we haven't uh, previously had or enjoyed. And so there's certainly the ability to extract lots of information and that's increasing with things like uh, streaming telemetry and, and gRPC and those types of protocols. But ultimately, we have to take what is lots of data and turn it into insight and intelligence that then we can use to create some uh, autonomy and some automation beyond what we currently think of today. So this is kind of our framework before we dive into the, to the rest of the presentation. There was a press release this morning that just came out from Siena. Um, they were our sponsor uh, partner for this uh, work that we just completed around uh, adaptive network uh, automation. And you can go to the Siena website. I, I produced these slides before the URL was available, but if you go to the Siena website, you can um, see that uh, press release. Um, it was an independent study conducted by us where we um, surveyed over 200 uh, different uh, types of service, provider, uh, service providers including um, internet content and cloud uh, and also large enterprises. And we were focused mostly on the, the network kind of outside of the data center um, with, that, um, with that analysis and, and that, was our, that was our focus. So network, true network automation outside of the data center. Um, we were looking at areas like access and, and uh, metro uh, optical long haul and the IP layer as well with edge routing and core routing and, uh, and also mobility. And so what are some of the findings from that um, research? And um, first, let's just start with what are service provider motivations um, for trying to do um, what we called here adaptive network automation, but we'll use the phrase generically automation. What are their motivations? And if you let your eyes look at the blue bars, um, those are the top ranked uh, items. And so we asked folks to rank one, two, three, four, five. What is the um, biggest motivation to the least motivation that is um, driving you to pursue this automation journey? And um, I guess a couple of things stick out for me um, a little bit, which is the top items are faster service delivery, um, we'd like to make customers happier <laughs> and increase our net promoter score or our customer satisfaction scores. We'd like to be able to do new services faster, and we'd also like to increase agility. I'll just say that, that costs are certainly there, especially operational costs when you talk to service providers. They're looking for automation to help bend the operational cost curve. That's a true statement. But I would argue that costs, whether it's CapEx, which you see very low here, or operational costs, I would say bending that curve is secondary to the primary um, items that you see at the top of the list, which is more about the, the faster service delivery and the happier customers. Um, some of the happier customer piece being even tied to you know, changing customer expectations. 
they're not willing to wait three months for a service to be delivered. That service needs to be delivered much more rapidly than that. And that's coming from their experience with um, cloud service instantiation and other types of things that, the, that customers are engaging in. And, uh, and so that's part of what's driving that uh, particular um, um, desire, if you will. Next was, um, what about what is, what is holding you back? What are the limits um, in terms of you achieving your adaptive network automation or making progress in this regard? And we asked folks to rate things that were severely limiting, um, somewhat limiting, somewhat limiting but improving. We, you know, we asked them to give kind of a color uh, on that. And the pieces you'll see from that, um, and this showed up multiple times, um, right at the top of the list were, were the top two items tended to be security and there's lots of angst around security because with automation I have the opportunity to do security right but I also have the opportunity to do it wrong really fast and a lot and so that's what has people nervous on the security side of things and that's why that bubbles up to the top when you uh, interview and, and talk to folks. Um, right behind that is analytics and intelligence. I have lots of data, but how do I turn that into something actionable, insightful? Um, and, and so that's why you see that uh, uh, populate there. And then the other is um, lack of trained personnel. That certainly in, in both our interviews and in our survey results, um, people are very concerned about an ability to bridge a combination of IT thinking and IT resources um, and software thinking and knowledge with traditional networking knowledge. Um, and um, that certainly, you know, percolates to the, to the top as well when you see um, folks talking about what's holding them back. And so I would say that, you know, to the vendor community, to the extent that you can help the service providers bridge that skills gap, I think that that is um, very positive for you and be something that the service providers um, really need and, and will uh, embrace. Um, last slide for this particular um, uh, analysis research for this presentation are what are the key components um, needed to increase your adaptive network uh, automation? And again, you see those that security and that analytics intelligence bubble to the surface. Um, and then along with that is network management uh, and control. And then there's a series of things kind of after that, like you know, open programmable um, access to, to data and infrastructure um, that we can get this um, set of information from what's actually happening live and in the network. Um, and I think that's it for this particular section. Yeah. So um, um, again, you can go to the Sienna's website, you can see the press release, and then if people have questions about this research, um, feel free to reach out to me or, or, or while I'm here the next several days, I'd be happy to, to talk about um, what we did there. I'm going to switch topics now to open source. And you might say, well, why is open source related? Well, the desire is to go faster and do more. And um, folks are looking for transformational change. And one of the tools in the toolbox to enable that is, is embracing open source. With open source, I have the opportunity to um, build an ecosystem of collaborators. I have an opportunity to share learnings and share um, uh, pieces of solutions that um, otherwise I as a vendor or I as a service provider might have to do individually and myself. And so um, we did a, um, extensive interviews with over 20 different executives in the uh, industry, both vendors, and uh, we categorize vendors into two categories for the purposes of this research. Um, we called them diversified portfolio companies, and we called them open source portfolio companies. The bottom line is this. There were companies that were born before open source existed, and there were companies that were born after open source exists and are embracing kind of a company paradigm that is tied to, to open source. And so we tried to segment the behaviors and the attitudes of those two vendor uh, sets of companies. In addition, then we also obviously did the service providers and did global um, interviews there as well. The areas of focus for the research were orchestration, SDN control, and then um, infrastructure. And infrastructure we did 
um, data center fabric switching, and we did transport routing. Um, and this whole report is public. It's on ACG's website. It's in the um, it's on the Linux Foundation's uh, website. You can pull it down. I, I have to warn you, it is 48 pages long, um, and so you may want to take it in increments, um, maybe at bedtime or something like that to help you uh, help you fall asleep or something. Um, let's talk about some of the findings, though, um, from this in terms of what are communication service provider motivations for open source adoption. And um, I'll just list the top three things that kind of pop out here. And the first is a desire to unify approaches to problems and to unify approaches to solutions. I think it's increasingly difficult for service providers to have to individually solve the same challenges over and over again. It's a global marketplace. And the competition is global in some ways. Those who are delivering services over the top as an example, uh, content delivery, video streaming, uh, et cetera. And so first and foremost was a desire to kind of unify the approaches of service providers for, I'll call it mutual benefit, so that you don't have to solve those problems uh, individually at a, every service provider level. Second was definitely a desire to avoid vendor lock-in. And it doesn't mean that the service providers want to churn their vendors all the time. It does mean they want the opportunity to hold their vendors accountable and to make, you know, ensure that they perform and not be uh, tied to a, a non-performing uh, vendor. So it's really, uh, as we talk to them, it, it's really born from that kind of uh, perspective. And then the third piece of that was access to a broader talent pool. Um, the problems we face are, are difficult and the ability to bring together an ecosystem of collaborators um, is thought to be powerful. And, uh, and more than maybe one service provider or more than one vendor could potentially provide. Um, next, we asked a series of questions around, uh, during the interviews and discussions around, what does it mean um, from a service provider's perspective to the future of their, their business and, and their interactions with, with vendors? And, and here's the good news for vendors. The good news is open source doesn't mean service providers want vendors to go away. It does mean that the relationship they have with them, they want to evolve and change. And the way they want it to evolve and change is to be more open, more collaborative, um, and to help them seek alignment with their own transformational goals. And I think the, the vendors that can do that and embrace that alignment with where the service providers want to go will benefit um, most from that and be um, um, you know, most adaptable um, to the future. The other, the other piece is, where will, where will service providers get open source code? Are they going to get it direct from the open source community? The answer is no. Generally speaking, a huge majority, something like 87%, want to see um, open source software come through a vendor or someone who's going to be accountable, that they can lean on for help, that they can help solve problems. And so I think the, the point I would make is that open source transforms the relationship between vendor and service provider, um, but it's not that service providers want you know, vendors to go away because somehow open source has solved all the world's problems. Um, that is not the case. Two other things I would point out. Um, open source software um, has tended to be less mature, I'll just say that, at least initially, and so you see an increased use of, um, an increased need for resources in the test and in the, um, um, the testing and the bug fixing and, and those kinds of pieces. And generally speaking, um, the feedback we've had is that folks need about, um, you know, to increase their staff in that area by about 30%. Um, over what they would do if they were using um, a vendor, you know, proprietary based uh, or a custom vendor solution. Um, and, uh, and then the last piece is, um, you know, service providers certainly have a thought that using open source will help them with their economics, whether it's the cost side or the, the revenue side of the equation. But I would say it's early days and um, you know, we're going to have to let this play out and get evidence that that's the case. Um, and I think that evidence will come over time, 
but we're still very early days in the utilization of open source to be able to definitively say, yes, look how much money this saves or look how much uh, benefit this brings. That is the end of uh, this presentation. Thank you very much uh, for your time.